this session is a session that I'm very passionate about, the understanding how development and the way that we develop our communities and our institutional settings actually influence health and well-being and sustainability. And we've got four presenters today who three are... Seconds. Oh, three I'm, presenters. I'm not presenting, I'm just for moderating. Oh, you're moderating. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, okay. So, uh, three, three presenters today who are going to be discussing some of the successes that they've had in integrating health and sustainability into the built environment. Great. Well, good afternoon. Yeah, good lunch. Um, so I just want to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Robert Palain, a, a local architect. I've worked with each of the panelists on different projects in different ways, both here at UCO and Okanagan College. Um, so I'm just going to introduce everyone and then we'll dive straight into it, because I know we only have a, an hour. So Teresa is a senior planner. So Teresa on the end is a senior planner at UBCO at the, at the mothership in Vancouver. Uh, Teresa provides planning, functional programming, pre-designed services uh, for new, um, new major capital projects and uh, renovations, including UBCO facility study, the Earth Science Building, um, and the Faculty of Pharmacy, or Pharmaceutical Sciences, I should say. Um, I should also add that Teresa in the last 12 months has improved her sustainable footprint by downsizing by 90% in terms of her property and gone from two cars down to one. Uh, Donna it, in the middle is the Regional Dean for Okanagan College, the South Okanagan Similkameen. Uh, I worked with Donna, uh, she was closely involved in the design, construction and operation of the Jim Patterson Centre of Excellence in Sustainable Building Technologies. This is one that was Chasing Living Building Challenge, if you're familiar with that, that has six prerequisites, 16 prerequisites, I should say, which includes net zero energy and water. Um, so in essence, that means significant, significant cultural change. And as regional dean, Donna was most definitely on the front line. So her report will be from message from the front lines, I imagine. <laughs> She's also an avid fan of both the Seattle Seahawks and the Pentics and the Bees. <laughs> um, Leanne, um, I don't know if any of you were in the session before lunch. Leanne is the Associate Dean of Sustainable Operations here on uh, uh, UBCO Okanagan. Leanne is a certified sustainability professional and CSR practitioner. Leanne leads sustainable sustainability strategy development, performance planning and change management on the campus, uh, as well as developing partnerships and funding to achieve campus energy uh, conservation. So that's our panel. Uh, I'll move for the drill, I'll ask Teresa, if you want to start us off. Okay. Um, thank you, Robert. And um, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel, I think. I don't know. Um, when um, Robert asked me to be on this panel, and uh, from the point of view of um, uh, the work that I do at UBC um, Vancouver campus and UBC Okanagan campus in sort of the uh, what we call planning stages or the pre-design stages of things. I thought that I w the way that I would approach it is largely through images and very sort of high level kind of considerations that we um, give to projects when even when they're in the very early uh, stages. And I asked myself if I could find sort of commonalities um, throughout them all and it was an interesting um, it was interesting because there are the, the first image that I have here is incidentally a, of the new student union building called the nest in the um, Vancouver campus we just only just opened it last week so um, planning for the built environment um, I thought I would first of all give a very um, high level um, comment and how, how we understand as facilities planners, how we understand uh, the built environment. And so I could just read this out. It's, it's very interdisciplinary. Um, I attended a, a session this morning um, where um, Abigail and Anthony um, talked about the UBC Okanagan Campus and Community Plan. And I found that very interesting because in my tenure at UBC, uh, I'm finding personally, and I think our unit is finding, is that that integration is happening more and more. So that's a very positive thing. So that interdisciplinary 
interdisciplinarity that describes the design, construction, management, and use of interrelated human-made surroundings, and all of that 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 encompasses. So as facilities planners, first and foremost, um, Robert will know this, is we're mainly involved in the actual uh, pl pre-planning or planning for pre-design planning for facilities. Um, and first and foremost, of course, is in terms of health and wellness and looking after the users and the campus citizens and wellness for students and, and campus citizens is life safety. And that's um, largely regulated in British Columbia for sure by um, building codes that take care of um, health and um, life, not health so much, but life safety. It's, Robert, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's moving more into the areas of health too with materials, uh, but possibly not quite there yet, but mainly in um, life safety and, and uh, what, what I thought I would talk about here is, is beyond that. What can we do um, for the creation of healthier social and physical environments for students and others beyond that, beyond what the code dictates that we must look after, you know, guardrails so you don't fall off, um, a certain amount of daylight or the certain size of windows in bedrooms and things like that. Um, and what are the strategies that we've been using to meet this goal? So first and foremost, and this may seem like an, a no-brainer, but it's actually probably one of the most critical ones is 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 where this facility is sited and it it can be in a, a developing or a more developed campus like uh, the Vancouver campus it can be as um, as large as an actual swap between buildings let's say that there's a kind of a co-locating thing beginning to happen where like-minded students where they're studying together or they're sharing information together or they want to connect with their faculty more together but the facility where they've been was way across campus. Maybe we would entertain a building swap or something like that. Um, thereby, hopefully a corollary of that is creating a sense of place and we heard, I heard that this morning at the planning, at the campus planning level too, so I'm very comfortable using that word. And a sense of place and, a, and by corollary a sense of community for students as well and for campus citizens. The other important thing is the functional program and um, I could spend the whole 10 minutes talking about that. But what we really try to do nowadays and maybe even since about 10 years ago is really embody sustainable ideas in the functional program. And um, I'm going to talk about two of them. Um, that as um, facilities planners and organizing space that we really pay attention to. And some could say that in a way it's kind of like fracturing old ideas. Uh, for example, uh, 20, 30 years ago we have, a, we have buildings on campus that have very large building plates and the idea was that the faculty offices were ringed around the exterior and we have this large building plate and this kind of dark area in the middle <laughs> where students and staff just kind of worked out their days. So the idea is to get away from that and to use the principle of light for all and how we're doing that. And at the same time, um, the principle of intensifying the use of space and asking users and faculty and even students, how can we share this space? How can we share meeting rooms and leading away from silos and territory and I suppose you could say that the underlying thought behind this is that co-locating and being together and finding precinctness and finding ways to share things and engage with, with each other more makes us in a sense happier. Um, I'm going to borrow from Robert knows this. I mentioned that I just uh, read a book, Charles Montgomery's book, um, Happy City, where he talks about those kinds of ideas. In admittedly, he's it's an urban design book, and he's talking about you know how if we live in cities that are dense and there's all the how how can we be happier? Get out of your car, be with people, engage on the street, walk and you know things like that why can't and so one of my thoughts is in a way we're creating a place on campuses too the Vancouver campus the UBCO 
campus, can we borrow some of those ideas? They're, they're not new ideas. He just happened to put them together in a way that I found was really um, digestible, really made a lot of sense. Um, so that, and then the fourth thing is we end up with guiding principles um, or the design brief that um, is almost always uh, created hand in hand with campus and community planning. And that these um, ideas inform the design of buildings and hopefully embody some of these strategies for, for creating healthier built environments. So in no particular order, I'm just gonna kind of whip through what some of them might be at a very high level. So these are two images. One is the, um, I said stairs front and center. And the reason why I'm saying that is because these are both fairly new buildings, the Earth Sciences Building and the new AMS Building. And when we put the stairs and we celebrate them and we make something of them, and a young woman this morning had uh, some touch points on what made people happy. One of them was beauty. When we do that, people use them. So yes, we need to still make sure that uh, accessibility is a pillar and universality in that. The elevators are there. They're easy to find, but they're not front and center. So this was just kind of, almost, you know, it's kind of almost like a no-brainer thing to do, is to get people moving, get them into their physicality, get them up and down those stairs. That's um, a five-story, a four-story building. This is a five-story building. So you can, or a four-story building in a bit, you can navigate all of those levels and incidentally kind of see what's going on at all those levels through the use of the stair. Um, Green roofs. Uh, this is an image of the um, SIRS building, Center for Interactive Research and Sustainability. Um, that roof has since grown up a lot. I found also an interesting comment this morning about um, bushes. This is, so you're actually, if you're working in this building, you're actually looking down on this. So in terms of, in terms of what this does for your wild well-being, it's, you know, reducing greenhouse gases, but it's also uh, um, looking out on nature. Um, putting bicycles near entrances, that's an easy thing to do. Make sure that kids use their bikes and that they're close to entrances. Um, natural light, exclamation mark, atrium buildings. These are two examples from UBCO campus. Um, one of them is from this building here, a legacy building. I'm hoping that we can um, find a way for for everyone to use that space and enjoy the light. But what it does is it gets light into the offices. Another older building on campus, it's not just the new buildings, uh, an extensive use of wood here too, which I'll talk about later. Um, two new buildings, the Sauter School of, building, uh, of Business, the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences. This um, strategy gets light to, into classrooms and offices. It also gets light into labs without the distraction of direct sunlight and things like that on the research that happens inside. I, I have to think that when we ask our researchers if this creates an environment that they find their work more enjoyable, they would say yes. Uh, landscape, um, moving between places, what you see. When I took this photograph, this pond was buzzing with dragonflies. That made me happy because um, I miss them have, growing up in Alberta. Um, another image, uh, sustainability. This, um, Abby used this image in her presentation. It's an outdoor workspace, but another aspect of this is the root, the rainwater leader was collected off the roof, dropped down into a channel and made a little rain garden that students engineered themselves and involved with an artist and you know, the contribution of landscape, very, very important to well-being and how our students learn and how staff um, operate on campus. Um, finding informal space for meetings, socializing, and relaxing. The image on the left is the architect's image. She's showing a more, you know, serious thing, but the image on the right, I actually took, people were sitting around, they'd been working in the lab all morning, and they were enjoying and laughing and sharing sharing some um, spontaneity. Uh, Non-toxic materials, this is again from SIRS, the extensive use of wood. I like this photograph because 
what we did here is we brought natural light into a classroom for years and years and years. We didn't do that. Now we can do it. And it seems to um, add to the experience. Um, the pharmacy building, uh, again, these were smaller offices, less space than the faculty had been used to, but designed with natural materials and a full wall of glass, north facing, so they got natural light and wood. And then this image I borrowed from the Ryerson Student Learning Center, which I just used. Um, that cladding on the walls, that's um, goat hair. So no off-gassing, but helped to uh, create a, an acoustical environment. Um, it was uh, important. Uh, layered social spaces. Um, I was interested to hear this morning young women talking about living a, in higher than five floors. There was well-being in four floors or under. And we're trying to address that with these lounges per floor that really kind of read as so if you come across the student lounge, layering of space, what if you just want to be quiet? Then there's a quiet part of it. What if you want to have a more of a social experience? Then you can look down and see where the activity is happening and make those decisions and choices. This is kind of an experimental idea that we're working through with the architects. I think it's pretty exciting, and I'll report back to see if it works or not. I have a feeling it will. And finally, furniture and differing modes and providing different ways for us to sit and relax and study where a rock can be a chair and I have to think that if you're sitting on a rock that's warmed by the sun that you may have a different approach to what you're doing than if you're sitting at a desk you know with your tablet in front of you and um, that's it that's just very some very high level pre-planning pre-design things that we try to embody in the functional program and the ideas before the building gets made. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> what we're going to do is have uh, some just questions and, and discussion time afterwards. So if you've got any questions, we can hold those and start. I'll invite Donna to come up and I'll get your PowerPoint working. Okay, great. Thank you, Robert. So good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, in 2009, Okanagan College was given permission to uh, build a building in Penticton on a smaller campus. At that particular time, the FD full-time equivalent headcount of student was about 650 students. Um, but we had, uh, we had a small physical location right on the highway, so a very prominent spot. But uh, we also had classes in downtown Penticton. And we also had classes at the airport. So one of the goals was to bring everybody home. So we wanted to build um, a multi-purpose building that would solve most of our problems and uh, try and uh, uh, create a, more of a campus feel um, within the city. The current campus is, as I said, located on Highway 97 as you're going along the channel. Um, the land is lease land that we lease from Transport Canada, so anything we do on campus has to have their, their approval. Um, we also uh, have the beacon, which is the last airport beacon, uh, probably the most critical one since it's the last one leading planes into, into the airport. So you've got to be pretty careful about uh, how you locate buildings and how high you build and all of those kinds of characteristics. What's interesting about uh, what became the Center of Excellence is that we were able to get permission from Transport Canada and from NAV Canada very, very quickly because they got on board with the project. And why did they get on board? Because the college uh, didn't initially set out to, to sort of be groundbreaking, but ended up trying to be groundbreaking by um, initially going for lead gold, that was the, the target, and eventually getting to where we thought, well, maybe lead platinum. But it was during the uh, search for the architectural firm that we began to discover uh, something called the Living Building Challenge. Um, now the four people who were involved that were considered to be the building committee, there was uh, two vice presidents, our Andrew Hay, Vice President of Education, Bob Eby was our uh, Vice President of Finance, 
uh, we had our director of facilities and myself on this particular committee. Now, you could not get four more sort of ego like, whoa, challenge, something we have to do. Uh, we didn't understand what it was. There's no way we understood what it was initially, but we just thought all these architects are talking about this living building challenge, we have to try it. It wasn't until we got further into it that we thought, whoa, what have we taken on? But again, very determined group of people who want to, to pursue this. We ended up hiring CEI architects and Robert Parlane actually became the project manager. So he understands the, uh, a, a lot of the, the angst of the project as well as some of the good things that came out of the project. One of the first things that we did initially was to have what was a, a charrette. And the charrette occurred in June 2009. And it was during that charrette that we introduced to the town the whole concept of the Living Building Challenge, as well as intro introducing it to the faculty. At that time, there was a lot of excitement around the fact that, oh, the campus is growing, there's an investment happening. It had only been a couple of years prior to that that there was actually some talk about closing the campus. So, so there was this sense of um, you know, optimism from the community as well as the campus. So a lot of people were behind the project, excited about it, but didn't really understand what we were talking about when we talked about the Living Building Challenge. Now there were lots of things that people began to become apprehensive about, especially the people who knew they were going to be moving into the building. But I'm going to focus in on one particular area. And that area is the whole idea of faculty common pod offices or open space offices. This was, uh, yeah, okay, so I got enough of the body language, I'm used to it now, um, but uh, the whole idea that um, you could have um, pods, and we were looking at about six, six, per, six office spaces within, within, the, uh, within the room, and the idea that it would be possible to construct these in such a way that we could meet the criteria of the Living Building Challenge, which required uh, natural light, uh, fresh air, um, the special choice of furniture, uh, creating uh, an environment that people would want to be in. And of course, because our goal is also net zero energy, this pod can be very friendly, but no microwaves, no kettles, no fans, nothing that's going to use surplus energy that we needed to get to our net zero energy. So, so you can imagine there were a few people concerned. And it was during the course of the construction of this, as it started to become more, that we began to, you know, I certainly realized, and, and I was the, of, the fo of the committee of four, I was the only one who was actually on the campus living the construction on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so people would be in my office going, look, I don't think I can do this, or what's this going to look like? And it was Robert Parlane's group who actually um, came up with, with options. So we, we did multiple layouts of what these offices might look like. And, and it, you know, interestingly enough, um, some chose, uh, the academic people chose sort of a small office, closed office look-alike, you know, in terms of how the furniture was going to be placed and how people would access the space. The trades guys wanted big open spaces with big tables, you know, maps, drawings, diagrams, those kinds of things. The technology people, they wanted pods of two, so they actually had their desks um, side by side, so there were two people literally sitting next to each other, and then there'd be another two people and another two people. So people chose different, different layouts, and we were able to, to convince people that these layouts would, would work and function for them. When it came time for people to actually move into, into the center of excellence, um, People acknowledged right away, and in and, and fairness, people came right to, the, right to my office and said, okay, I really like the air. That is the number one thing that I hear constantly from students, staff, is we really like the air. There was fresh air, but the second thing they really liked was the constant temperature. Uh, the fact that, you know, today it could be, you know, well, for example, a week, and a week and a bit ago, it was 38 degrees in Penticton. That building has no air, traditional air conditioning, but the building was perfectly 
temperature. Mm -hmm. You could walk through it and it felt good. We had lots of classes going on. Sure, when the building tells us to, we open the windows, but the building will also tell us, I think it's usually about 28 Celsius. And that's when the building says, okay, close the windows. I can do better on my own. Um, so, so, you know, you're, they're interacting with wow. it and they're able to have their office spaces um, pretty constant. Same in the winter. You can wear, you could wear, you know, except for the fact that you have to get to the parking lot, you could wear light clothing and, and feel fine in, in terms of the space and not feel like you have to put sweaters and stuff on. So people, they like that. They also like the silence. Like right now, I can hear a buzz. But if you go through the center of excellence, you don't hear that. In fact, it was our adults basic, basic education students who, who told us very clearly that the building was at peace. <laughs> and and, and that, you know, that gave people working in the building um, just that extra comfort as you're, you know, maybe stress as you're working on a project or whatever. But the silence was certainly something that, that people really enjoyed. Um, other, other characteristics that they really liked is that people did find that they were doing more collaboration with their colleagues around projects. And uh, people did find that um, because we were able, with the architect's help, because we were able to address some of the principal concerns, and the principal concerns were privacy, opportunities to have conversations with students, for example, that were private. They, they were also concerned about uh, conference calls, meetings that you were doing extensively on the phone. Um, there was also concern about storage, how much storage you would have in terms of your office spaces. And so we dealt with all of those questions by each pod has a meeting room that you can set up t your telephone in or you, you book and you have your office hours and so you can have private conversations with your students. And those pods, that, th that office is assigned to that pod and nobody's allowed to use it other than that pod. So what that does is, is they always know that there's a space. And so far we've been fortunate that people's time schedules are such that there's been no overlapping of the office space. Um, the other thing we were able to do, pardon, two minutes. The other thing we were able to do was we were able to provide uh, each office areas with extra locked storage so that they can put things away. So as a consequence of, of the effort to try and meet those conditions, people have bought into the goal of the Learning Building Challenge. And although we, when we moved in, we had four office suites, no, three office suites full. By the following Christmas, I had longtime faculty who had individual offices coming to me and saying, okay, we'd like to make the move. So all the office pods are now full, um, and uh, about half the people have asked to be there. The other half are people that we brought back on campus and, w and really didn't have an option for them. But what's interesting is that when an office space does come available, people can, you know, we send out a notice and it goes to the most senior person. None of the people who've come back on campus have asked to, be, to go back into a, an old style office. So at the end of the day, um, People, when they see real value, so when we build a really sustainable building and people see it and they experience it, you can make change. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's for everyone because it's not. There are some people for a variety of reasons who absolutely have to have those four walls. And, and the be, you know, we have to be able to give them that. But for, for the vast majority of people, they find that this kind of office space can work for them, providing the conditions have been set up for it. And the fact we, we did get LEED Platinum for the building two weeks ago, so we're thrilled about that. And we think we are four, uh, we, we believe we have the data to support four pedals of the Living Building Challenge, and there are six. And we're working on the fifth, which is the energy net zero. And we're pretty confident we will get there. And, um, and as a consequence, um, the building has certainly lived the promise. It wasn't easy, but people b bought into the promise and bought into the, what became the reality of the building. And uh, it's been pretty, pretty successful for us. Anyway, so. I decided not to do it. Uh, you can, okay. if you want to just, if you can just click two clicks, you'll see 
if you go forward to there. That's, the, uh, that's one office space and that's a, a second design. So there's just two, two designs that, um, you know, that's a trades one where they've got uh, a little bit more space for all their, their maps and their drawings and things. And if you go back, this, this, this was an academic setup um, and this particular space, all that furniture is movable. And by the way, the office is exactly the size of a classroom and the paint on the walls is such that it can in fact revert to a classroom without us doing any renovation. Because the one downside of a wood building doesn't renovate well. We've already put one renovation, we put a wine sensory lab in this building and that, that was a major effort because of the wood, wood construction and stuff. But, um, but those are the kind of offices that, that came out of it. Thank you very much. Um, so just an admin thing, I, I should have mentioned the fact no one has any conflicts of interest I'm supposed to. Right, so I forgot. Um, so if you invite Leanne, I'll just mm -hmm, grab your sure. PowerPoint. No, I can drive, yeah. yeah. Thanks very much. Hey, thanks, Robert. Thanks to my colleagues. Um, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I'm going to use the presentation that um, Teresa referred to this morning that I delivered um, uh, in conjunction with our uh, Director of Campus Planning and Development, Anthony Haddad, and my colleague, Abigail Riley, um, regarding um, some recent uh, planning events on this uh, campus and try to create a bit of a link um, between how our campus planning efforts can um, strategize uh, uh, achieving the health and well-being um, of the campus. So kind of taking it um, to a bit more of the policy level, um, we, we've gone through extensive change um, and growth over the course of uh, the last five, seven years on this campus, as many of you probably know. Um, we're currently situated in one of the five legacy um, campus buildings, one of the original buildings that was here at the time that we were Okanagan College. And then some of the buildings to toward the uh, periphery of this core campus, one of them being the Engineering Management and Education Building, is one of our newer academic um, facilities. And so all of those newer academic facilities are built to lead uh, gold standard and they are heated and cool using uh, a district energy uh, system. So we are situated on top of a very large aquifer and we source uh, ground heat from that aquifer to heat and um, uh, to heat our, our academic buildings. And these legacy buildings as well have been retrofitted to, to heat as well. So um, just bearing in mind that a lot of the development that's already taken place and a lot of the design elements that Teresa was mentioning in her um, presentation and sort of those pre-designed processes were all part of um, the build out, of the first build out of, of this campus. And so now that we've kind of hit um, a steady state with that particular phase of development, the next um, phase of development has just been um, strategized vis-a-vis -vis our uh, campus, UBC Okanagan campus plan. So my colleague Abby uh, presented this earlier this morning. And really, the, the emergent Okanagan campus plan sets the framework for the future development of this campus to, to 2030. And it really provides the enabling policy and um, principles and directions for what will be core areas of focus um, for this campus as we, as we move um, forward. So one of the um, four key principles um, in that campus plan is planning principle number four which strategizes that campus growth should be managed through a whole system lens that incorporates environmental, economic, and social sustainability outcomes to achieve a net positive impact on the well-being of the campus community and its ecology. So this is particularly powerful as a policy um, uh, statement because, again, it gives us the uh, permission to then roll out implementation plans to achieve, achieve this policy uh, intent. So a whole systems planning approach really captures op opportunities for campus uh, integration of campus systems um, between the, the, the areas that are listed there below. So when we look at um, developing future buildings or 
looking at um, how we're going to treat our naturalized environment or um, landscaped areas, um, we begin to see that there, there are synergies and there are uh, relationships between, for example, or overland stormwater management, water, energy carbon, biodiversity, and waste. And so, um, and we can create synergistic benefits. So for example, just um, uh, below the engineering management and education building, you may have noticed um, there's a pond there. It was built as a um, stormwater detention pond. It was an engineered feature. Um, and a way in which this campus could um, you know, divert stormwater from the municipal system. But over time, it's actually developed into a real hot spot of um, biodiversity, and it really does support ecosystem services on campus, and some um, blue-listed species even on campus, and we've got a variety of nearly 50 birds there. So starting off with you know, this, this initial engineering feature, now having that developed into kind of this beautiful ecosystems asset that people now visit, we're also contributing to you know, campus health and well-being um, because people that visit that pond find it to be a beautiful, peaceful sanctuary, a place of repose, a place of contemplation, uh, and it also serves as a place for education and, and pedagogy as well. So through planning, um, I guess my point here is that it's, it's through buildings that we can definitely achieve human health and well-being through the design of buildings, but um, we can also think about the ways in which we design our uh, campus environment and how that environment interacts with the buildings to create a campus system as a whole that can support the health and well-being um, of, our, of our community. So the, the um, so as a, as a, as a uh, follow-up to the campus plan, then we are developing a whole systems plan, and it's designed to be an operational implementation plan um, that really strategizes for the operators of the campus how we can build uh, the campus, build the campus out, how we can streamline our efforts with the intent of the campus master plan, um, and ensure that we are being good stewards of sustainability while at the same time creating uh, a very healthy um, campus environment for our constituents. And the whole systems plan framework is also intended to create opportunities for additional campus engagement. So many of the um, planning efforts that uh, are contemplated, um, we will absolutely engage um, our campus constituents in, in helping out with the implementation of. So, um, and I have some examples of that coming up on the next slide. Uh, worth noting here the draft and very much in draft whole systems goals. Um, we've, we've vetted these by our steering committee for the, the plan, but they've not, uh, not been endorsed beyond that yet. We're looking to regenerative goals for this campus for 2050. So we're looking at through um, this plan that all of our buildings will achieve net positive performance in operational energy and carbon by 2050. We're looking at developing a framework that supports low embodied uh, carbon future development. So what that means is all of the materials um, that we source to build our buildings, we're looking for low embodied carbon within those materials to further reduce our, um, our impacts. We're looking to continue to optimize water quality, supply, and security. So the Okanagan uh, Valley, this particular region, is characterized as a semi-arid desert, and so we are very concerned about future water scarcity, we're concerned about the water quality and ensuring good sustainability stewardship um, moving forward, so that's a key goal for us. Optimizing diversion of stormwater, so we already divert 100% from the new municipal system, so we'd like to continue that. Um, and striving toward full waste recovery and reuse is another key area, first starting with um, avoiding uh, waste from coming on campus in the first place, so working with uh, some of our suppliers on uh, their responsibilities to take back um, product, and then of that waste that comes on campus, we want to be able to recover it and reuse it. A good example of this is um, three of our uh, buildings here on campus house very large computer server rooms, and you wouldn't necessarily think that the heat generated off those computer server rooms 
is a waste, but in fact it is. It's a waste and it, we have to then use energy to cool those computer rooms. So instead of doing that, we're able to capture the heat off the computer server rooms, pipe that heat into the, the district energy system. So following the principles of industrial ecology, waste becomes fuel. Um, enhance and restore the site's ecology, so I've spoken a bit about that already. Two minutes. Okay. This is an interesting map because um, it allows us to look at the various um, areas um, for sustainability sh stewardship in the center there, and then we're able to map our proposed measures against this matrix. So you can see that in some cases the proposed measures only impact one uh, one area um, of our of our whole system's um, paradigm, whereas you know others touch every single aspect. So clearly, um, within a, a, a good business case framework, we're going to be strategizing those measures um, that can have greatest impact um, through this whole system lens. And so our implications to health and wellness then, I guess this plan um, is going to help us create um, the infrastructure servicing to support future development um, and in doing so mitigate uh, climate change impacts, um, reduce the demand and use of energy and water resources on campus, support biodiversity in our ecosystem services, preserve the cultural landscape. I've spoken about the reuse of waste energy and materials, um, engage our campus community in implementing some of these measures, and ultimately create a healthy physical environment in which we can live, work, and learn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, I'm gonna sort of steer the conversation a little bit now towards this um, aspect of cultural change that we uh, sort of touched on. Um, I will open up to questions. I've got a few to start the discussion. Um, I would ask that we, we avoid the parking question purely because from past experience, parking tends to dominate conversation. So much as it's a valuable conversation, I think there's, there's more interesting things to talk about if, if people are okay with that. Um, so I, I'm going to start with a few questions and then we'll, we'll open up to the floor. Um, so Leanne, first, uh, your first one. If, if I could ask, do you think students coming to a post-secondary institute like UBC or OC expect to be challenged? And I'm, I'm talking not necessarily just academically, but to be challenged in their lifestyle choices, in sustainability, well-being. Do, do you think that's an expectation when they're coming here? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question, Robert. And I think um, we're very very fortunate at UBCO to have a, a really engaged student body. Um, a student body that's really interested in sustainability stewardship and really um, taking the lead, actually, in um, developing some very, um, very creative uh, initiatives um, that can ultimately serve to to um, help us achieve our our collective goals. So yeah, they do. They expect to be challenged, um, but they also come to the table, challenging us, <laughs> and that's a wonderful thing. Um, the next question is, is a tough, and I, 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 I admit that we were chatting over this over lunch as well, I'm going to ask Teresa, it's the sort of toughest question. Um, so e even though both UBC and Okanagan College consult quite wide, widely in terms of preparation for any, any project, um, well-being and sustainable initiatives, as, as Donna has highlighted, are seldom universally popular. Um, so my, my question really is, is, to what extent do you think an institution like UBC as a collective group, is entitled or even obligated to impose cultural change on the individual, whether it's students or faculty, for the sake of the bigger goal? Um, I told you it was a tough question. That is a very tough question. Mm -hmm. you know, and I think, um, first of all, I have to say that I'm glad that you used, um, that you included the phrase consultation or engagement or, you know, because we do do that. And nothing really happens unilaterally. And I, I suppose um, we do consult. We do try to talk with users. And it's part of the change management, even though that we may feel uh, as an institution that we have a desired outcome in the end. We need to 
I think we have an obligation if we if if we're going to use the word obligation to devote to inform as much as possible, right? And in that information sharing, you do you do have debate, and sometimes the debate gets quite heated, and you just have to listen to that and keep that in mind. The second part of the question: Does the university have a, uh, as a collective entitled or obligated. I actually wor workshopped that question within the group of senior planners and, and administrators that I work with. And I think the, um, within the context of consultation and an engaged process, I think the answer is that's what a university is. Within society, that's what a university does. It, it's one of its roles is to be at the forefront with research and all kinds of research and initiatives to put forward and lead with these new ideas and to test them and to not be afraid to do that. So I think that, you know, within the group and workshopping that question, I think that's a kind of um, what, we, what we came up with. But that change management is very much a part of, and that, that is sometimes a rocky road. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that? Okay, um, so, so Donna, um, so we talked about this, the, the collective imposing sustainable initiatives. Um, what about um, sort of bottom-up initiatives, so grassroots initiatives? We had some of those this morning in the sessions. Do you have any tips or recommendations for uh, so bottom-up initiatives? Um, well, certainly when, um, when we opened up the Center for, Lens for Excellence, it opened in June 2011, and the students that were on campus at that particular time were mostly trade students, and uh, they ended up having all kinds of su suggestions as they moved in, and they were starting, because when I say multi-purpose, this building has six shops in it in addition to all the other um, spaces. And so they had lots of suggestions about what they wanted to see in terms of saving energy. They became competitive with each other as to which shop would use the less, uh, less amount of power. Um, they also um, came up with strategies to, to try and sort of emulate some of the things they were learning into their patterns. So we did have some of them biking for a while. Didn't last, but they were for a little while. Some of them were biking and trying to take advantage. In the case of employees, um, there were quite a few employees who started to come forward with suggestions. And they, they were around something that really dealt with the functioning of the building. So for example, I would have people coming in saying, why are the lights on in June when you know it's bright, it's light enough until 9 o'clock at night? Why, why, why are the lights on? Why are, like all of these sort of systems things that I'm certainly not going to notice at, at the, and so people were people were coming in with all of those suggestions so we've actually made a lot of move progress towards net zero energy by rethinking how we operate and a lot of that came from the grassroots saying we need to make some we need to make some changes here so so certainly that has been part of the the process of of learning to live with the building and letting the building kind of provide its suggestions around what it wants in order to, to be more sustainable. Okay, um, I'll throw it open to all three of you. Any, you know, we've had a lot of examples. Any examples of initiatives that have not gone well that you'd like to share? You know, based on that we learn by mistakes as well as things that go well? Well, I know in the case of the Center for Excellence, um, there are a few things that that um, I mean, we pushed the envelope on a lot of things, and we, and we realized that we we thought they were well, sort of thought out decisions. But there were a couple of decisions. First of all, we moved to that. Uh, uh, what kind of paint was that? That was on the. Yeah, it, it 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 was to eliminate all the whiteboards, and we we eliminated the need for smart boards and things by going to a, a different type of uh, projector. Um, but we ended up using painted surfaces as your as your whiteboard. That I would was definitely not uh, something that we would do again, at least in the form that we did. Other things that we that we did is um, because the building was such a large 
investment in Penticton. I mean, Penticton is a town of 35,000. So when the government comes in and makes a $30 million investment, that's significant. And so the community has a real sense of ownership of the, of the building. So now I do get continuous phone calls and things about why am I not watering the grass properly? It's going brown. <laughs> or why, why are the facility workers not cleaning the, the bathrooms properly? Because there is a stain from the water that we, the geothermal water that we're using. Or, you know, those kinds of things. So it's been a real good education process to be able to then go back and say, no, 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 we need to rethink our expectations. I mean, the ground is, you know, the grass is deliberately going brown. Um, and this is why the washrooms appear not to be as clean as you would like when in fact they're very clean. It's just chemical or uh, minerals that are staining uh, the sinks and things. So those kinds of things have been great opportunities to be able to, to keep it as a learning facility. Anything from um, I would, I can't, I can't specifically find anything that hasn't gone, um, that's any different from any other kind of building strategy. Right. You know, when you uh, embark on a new project, there's always going to be uh, things that were wished for and hoped for and tried and regardless of whether it's under this initiative or that initiative. So I don't really want to um, point that out. I think. The, the thing that interests me is that, for example, it's, it's getting the message out, and I think Donna touched on that, is that everybody here is kind of on the same page, right? It's, the, it's, it's others who just don't believe it, right, and yeah. don't want to believe it, that sometimes as facilities planners, we just experience some frustration. And maybe within your purview, you have the same kind of experience, right? So what to do about that? I think just um, for the next crop of facility planners coming up, the next crop of students coming up who embrace this area of interest is just keep persevering and um, creating um, different modes of messaging you know, that um, can be, you know, get the message through. I would add to um, uh, Teresa and Donna's uh, excellent points. Um, Teresa, you, you tweaked something in me about the, the whole education piece or getting mm -hmm. the, word, the message out. And to me, that's been absolutely fundamental um, to the extent that people are informed about what's happening or understand, you know, what's happening. Maybe some of the subtleties in terms of what to do and what not to do in your geothermal building um, to help it run better, to help, you know, for consistent heating and cooling. Really engaging people um, in that discussion and making them aware. Um, so just way beyond the whole planning, but, you know, once things are getting implemented to ensure that you bring people along um, is really, really critical, yeah. Right. Yeah, it's, it's sort of changing away from that, I told you so, to, yeah. you know, well, help us out here. Yeah. You know, what do we, you know, what can we do next, or let's work with that, right? Yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to throw it over if people want to comment on any of anything that's been discussed or any questions. I'm not sure if what I want um, to ask is based off of exactly what you all were talking about, but coming from, I mean, I work in a totally different area than this, so this is very interesting. Um, and particularly, uh, Donna, I, I was, your presentation, just all the different points I found really, really interesting about, you know, ha the intentionality around the spaces and what you've, what you've done there. What peaked for me, though, was um, just this piece around engaging people and communicating um, what you've done and what you've put into it and how to help others gain the kind of appreciation for the, the kind of thoughtfulness that's gone into the design? And is there, has there been effort towards that? I mean, I sort of consider, you know, when you go into a park or a space and there's information there about, you know, the, the environment and what they've, for those of us who don't know, who don't understand how these spaces are designed and what's been put into them, is there ever effort to do that or? 
Committee. You're, yes. You said Donna, but you're looking at oh, me. Oh, sorry. So um, is it address? I'm Teresa. Teresa. So is the you. question yeah, addressed yeah. to me? Yes. Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think the short answer is not enough. So I should put my um, money where my mouth is or whatever. I will say though that we work with consultants. You know, it's this is an interdisciplinary pursuit, creating a built environment, and um, our consultants do a lot of that messaging for us. Right? They take it out there, they keep presenting it, they um, they grow their knowledge and then bring it back to us. So it's a bit of a circular thing. So because of that, it hasn't really fallen 100% of us to do that, but I, I hadn't certainly not anticipated a question like that, and I think it's a good one because I think it reinforces the comment I made, is that it's in the messaging, it's in getting the message out however however, however we do that, and we need to pay more yeah, attention to that. Yeah, I just can them. imagine, I'd love to go down to that, the pond you were talking about and have, you know, a, a little yeah. board there or something that told me all of that because I wouldn't know as a lay person, I would, right. I would have no idea all the thought that was put into that and I, how I will interesting that would be. I will say that the Center for Interactive Research and Sustainability does do that, mm -hmm. right? You, wherever, you know, that's a working, living building and, you know, they, the, the um, Dr. Robinson and his group and the tenants of that building do, even the ones who aren't necessarily fully engaged in the sustainability initiative do a really good job of talking about the building they know the building and they um, I, I know whenever I'm in there I eat my lunch in there every other day somebody asks me something about it and you know mm -hmm. we do try to talk about that I, I would add the service building is, is also chasing living building challenge and, and one of the requirements for living building challenge is that the building must be educational in terms mm -hmm. of what it's doing, and that's a key part of the mm -hmm. challenge. Um, and it's mandated it must be open for educational purposes to the public mm -hmm. at least one day a year. And obviously, that for mm -hmm. this building, that's that's easy. But any living building challenge has to be open to the public Great. for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for um, sharing. It was wonderful to see all the the buildings that you've had a chance to kind of make a real impact with. Um, I'm just wondering for, for our campus, um, we don't often get the opportunity to build brand new structures. We're often kind of retrofitting existing buildings. So I'm wondering if you can kind of share your expertise on what kind of elements could be incorporated into existing buildings that could kind of fit with the idea of sustainability and social um, wellness. Let's talk about that. Well, you should answer that question, Robert. <laughs> 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 um, I think you should take yeah, a stab at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know they're going through a trades building at OC at the moment yeah. on the Clone campus, um, yeah. and that's a mixture of new build and um, like renovation of existing. Um, and you know, existing buildings make up the large majority of all our building stock, so it, it's a very key aspect to, uh, you know, as, as I said, you know, it's a big key aspect to sustainability. And it's uh, to reuse an existing building is, is you know, by its very nature is sustainable. Um, the, no, Donna can correct me, if I, I think the, the new building, the, the new part of that building is going for Living Building Challenge, the existing is going for Platinum. That, um, right? that, was, that was the original, original intent. intent, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Uh, um, but, it is, but it is challenging because you're, you're melding new space and, and retrofitting old space. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I know that that's still a, a goal, but I, I've heard it's challenging. Usually the challenge is with the mechanical systems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, that takes up a big piece of the infrastructure dollars and the infrastructure deferred maintenance. And, you know, sometimes it frustrates us, I think, because, or me anyway, because we want, um, we want those funds to go into you know, creating space for learning and community and stuff like that. But it's, it's just like anything, you have to have good infrastructure that's behind the scenes doing its work quietly 
and properly and not uh, creating greenhouse extra greenhouse gases so a lot of the times all of that well certainly Leanne talked about the ground water that whole loop that was created here we don't see it but it's a big deal in terms of you know, and I think all of the uh, 50s linked into it, and yeah. this building's linked yeah. into it. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that's so that's an example of a retrofit, right? Because these originally buildings weren't um, designed that way, and so the retrofit was enabling that connection to the DES. And then just to quickly add, um, there is a lot of work underway so that if we are doing, for example, a renovation to a space in an existing building we will um, immediately look for the sustainability wins. So whether it's trying to create more energy efficiency through upgrading our HVAC systems, or maybe we need a new high efficiency backup boiler, um, or maybe we install uh, water savings features if we're doing a, a wash and retrofit. So those are kind of the low hanging fruit pieces that we try to, to pick off and those will uh, enable us to generate dollar yeah. savings that can then go into things changing over lamps right you know if we get a project large enough yeah. we might just sort of kind of try to sneak, <laughs> sneak <laughs> that in there you know yeah. thank you I think we're out of, we're out of time I'd love to, love to carry on the conversation so if you just join me I'd like to thank our panelists for the next mm -hmm. discussion yeah, thank, thank you, you